La bocca sollevò dal fiero pasto quel peccator, forbendola a capelli del capo che gli aveva di retro guasto. These are some of the most famous Italian poetry lines ever written and some of the most famous lines of the Divine Comedy. I'm uh, talking about uh, Canto 33 of Inferno and uh, thank you everyone for watching this video. Uh, this, I'm Tom in Los Angeles uh, wearing a shirt today that's uh, probably the most inappropriate to talk about uh, the topics that I'm going to talk about the content of uh, Inferno 33 but um, try to get in that type of state of mind of uh, the bottom of hell where Dante is describing these facts these lines are famous first of all because of the language which is sublime sublime meaning in the, in the sense of uh, perfect for the purpose that Dante has here going back to his concept of mimesis the language replicating reality or imitating reality the sounds in Italian um, if you could hear all those R sounds the, uh, particularly in Italian the R sounds uh, a little aggressive and that's what Dante wants to replicate the sound of somebody who is I mean we are in front of a beastly scene somebody uh, behaving like a beast knowing at somebody else's um, somebody else's cranium another reason why these lines are so popular and famous is that Dante managed to infuse them with uh, so much drama and emotional power that uh, many commentators have said even if the second terzina is uh, very closely inspired by um, some verses from the Aeneid in uh, the second book of the Aeneid, verses number three, Aeneas is uh, making a speech um, to Dido, and it's a very sad speech. So you ask me to endure relieving a grief so desperate, the thought torments my heart even as I prepare. This is along the lines of that speech, but in this type of context, many commentators have said Dante is able to generate more emotion, more drama out of this Tarzini than what Virgil was in, uh, in the second book of Aeneid. But if my words are seeds with fruit of infamy for this traitor, I will both speak and weep within your sight. The way that uh, Dante, at the end of uh, Canto 32, uh, was able to convince Conte Ugolino to speak to him was to promise some uh, help in uh, uh, bringing his uh, reputation and the truth of his facts uh, up on earth when Dante goes back. So Count Ugolino introduces himself to Dante and uh, he says, I don't know who you are that come here or how, but you're surely Florentine to my ear. Uh, Ugolino understands that Dante is from Florence based on his accent. And uh, I was Count Ugolino and this is Archbishop Ruggeri. Dante is very direct here in making us understand who he is talking about. Uh, however, this was a very popular um, fact of, for the contemporary chronicles of Dante's times. Uh, everybody knew what happened to Count Ugolino in Dante's times. Ugolino della Gerardesca, he was part of one of the most powerful families in uh, Pisa one of the most powerful Ghibelin families in Pisa and uh, he was a politician, a high-level politician. Um, initially, in uh, around 1275, he joined with uh, a Guelph family, the Visconti, to gain power for political ambitions and uh, he failed, so he was exiled from Pisa. This is what happened in those times. You tried um, your political career, you failed, you were out. Um, but he also was a, a, a flip-flopper from a political point of view and so he could he really tried to get uh, alliances wherever he could he didn't care if it was Ghibellines or, or Guelphs so later on we see him um, back in Pisa 
and this time he joined with this uh, Archbishop Ruggeri, who was a very powerful local um, Archbishop. And uh, uh, Archbishop Ruggeri, uh, up to a certain point, helped Ugolino uh, gain power. For a period of time, Ugolino was able to reign over Pisa um, together with Nino Visconti, who was another who was another politician, but that we understand that Dante had um, a lot of admiration for. Uh, Dante thought that Nino Visconti was a good man, a good politician. And this uh, is why we, we see what we see here. Because after gaining power, um, Ugolino, together with Archbishop Visconti, they conspire to get Nino Visconti out of Pisa so they can have even more power for themselves. And after doing that, Archbishop Ruggeri betrayed Ugolino himself um, in the worst of, of ways um, by accusing him of uh, betrayal of Pisa uh, based on uh, the, sale, the sale of uh, a few castles that were owned by Pisa to Florence. And we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later as an excuse and he imprisoned him together with four children of his two direct children and apparently two grandchildren in a tower that uh, since that event uh, was then called the tower of hunger and uh, after keeping them uh, locked up for eight months he the archbishop decided to have them starve to death in the same tower but absolutely horrible behavior from the Archbishop, who was also condemned by the current Pope as well because of this fact. But the current Pope, uh, um, if I read correctly, didn't have um, a lot of time to manage this uh, situation because he died. And so Archbishop Ruggeri was able to um, live without many more problems in his, uh, in his old age. So we understand why Archbishop Ruggeri is here um, in this antenora as political traitor. Uh, we also understand uh, why Ugolino is here, even though there has been a lot of uh, dialogue and uh, discussion around uh, the actual reason why Dante places Ugolino here, because he did a lot of political betrayals in his life, in his career. So which one did Dante choose him from? Maybe all of them, that's also possible. In any case, um, what matters to Dante is also, and maybe particularly, the way in which Ugolino is telling his story. Um, as powerful as it is, and dramatic and, and horrifying as it is, um, it sounds strange to Dante. Uh, Dante can see through the type of narration that Ugolino chooses. In fact, um, if we look at the Italian side of this uh, uh, verse 20, from 20 to 30, really. There are uh, more than four, I think four or five, instances of uh, the pronoun me, which in Italian means uh, mine, me, mine. Uh, and this is not random. It's something that Dante did to accentuate the fact that Ugolino is very egotistic in the way he's presenting his uh, narration. His, all his entire attention is on himself, while uh, somebody who tells such a story, as uh, cruel and uh, horrific as it is, uh, would immediately mention the children, which is the most horrific thing about the story. But for Ugolino, he is the center of, of the whole story. So, in the, on the Italian side, we have on verse 20, Come la morte mia fu cruda, uh, udirai e saprai se mi ha offeso, second, uh, la qual per me ha il titolo della fame, e, e mi aveva mostrato, mi aveva mostrato, those are four personal pronouns that refer to himself, Ugolino. So, certainly there is a, a deep meaning there, something that Dante is communicating to us, and by which Dante explains to us also his lack of uh, sympathy and compassion for this character. Uh, Dante has grown, Dante has uh, evolved since uh, the beginning of Inferno, and he now is at a moral advantage situation where he 
he is able to discern at least uh, who deserves compassion in Inferno as a soul and who doesn't. And uh, in his opinion, rightly so, uh, Ugolino doesn't. In fact, uh, these traitors find themselves with all these cannibalism images, etc., find themselves in uh, behaviors that have almost lost entirely of humanity. They are almost completely beastly. So Count Ugolino doesn't spend any word on uh, the background of his uh, situation. And he jumps right into the narration in the moment where he's already in this tower, Tower of Hunger, um, when, when he was locked up, it was called the Muda Tower. And uh, it can be seen actually today in Pisa. Um, and he tells of a dream that one uh, night he had, almost a vision uh, that is predicting his future. A dream where he saw this man appear as Lord of the Hunt, uh, chasing a wolf. The dream is a clear allegory of uh, the political situation with Ruggeri. Ruggeri had uh, rounded up all the most powerful Ghibelline families in Pisa, who uh, are the Gualandi, Sismondi and Lanfranchi, named here. Um, they were the wealthiest and most uh, influential families. And uh, he was uh, um, using them as uh, hounds, as dogs, against the, the wolf and, and the cubs. Interesting the fact that Ugolino doesn't represent himself as uh, anything but a wolf. So he knows there's something about him that is already quite uh, evil and uh, not completely uh, without fault. But uh, his focus is, is on himself. Now, after a short run, father and sons seem spent and uh, sharp fangs seem to tear. So he woke up after this vision, after this, this dream, and uh, he heard the complaint of his own children. The narration here is, uh, in fact, very, very clear. This uh, nightmare that uh, Golino with his children had lived in the tower uh, nobody knows, nobody knew in Dante's times exactly what happened. Uh, but Dante, with his imagination, tries to recreate it, and uh, it's terrible, obviously. It's, uh, uh, it's worse than a horror movie here. It's interesting how Golino addresses Dante with, uh, if not now, then when do you shed a tear? He's almost asking him and provoking him to say, uh, why are you not moved by this terrible story that I'm telling you? And Dante doesn't say anything because he's, uh, as, as I mentioned, on a moral uh, level at this point that doesn't allow him to have compassion for somebody who, who doesn't deserve it. And so he's, he does have this uh, indignation, which he considers righteous uh, verse, um, towards Ugolino. If you look at uh, verse uh, 47 uh, in Pinsky, he says, uh, inside me I was turned to stone, so hard I could not weep. I find it fascinating how um, Dante is using basically one word to uh, express what in the English translation takes uh, at least seven or nine words to express. Uh, he's using the word uh, impetrai. Impetrai means uh, I became like stone, but it's so concise and condensed. Inside me, I was turned to stone so hard. Ugolino's behavior with his children um, also is very informative to us because he is not uh, trying to console them. He is not uh, doing what a Christian father would do in, in such a situation. If you imagine being in a situation like as desperate as that one, at least pray, at least think about your, your soul, your children's souls. But he does nothing. He just uh, stares and uh, he thinks the, the best thing to do, the right thing to do for him, is to be very stoic uh, in the style of Seneca. Instead of praying, he says nothing. He is uh, behaving like a stone. The scene is made even more sublime, in my opinion, by the fact that it carries a lot of echoes of, of the Gospels. Um, in particular, on verse 56, they thought it did it from my hunger's pain, and suddenly rose. Father, our pain, they said, will lessen if you eat us, which is a Eucharistic offer. That's uh, the underlying image 
and meaning that Dante is writing here. Um, he also includes uh, he also includes on uh, verse uh, 65 and 66, uh, Father, why don't you help me, uh, the child, to Ugolino, which is a perfect echo of Jesus' last words in uh, in um, Matthew's Gospel. So there is a, an underlying current of, uh, uh, of of huge contrast between the the beastly cannibalism of Ugolino and the uh, divine Eucharistic meaning. One line that I absolutely love is line number uh, 75. Uh, Poscia più che il dolor poté il digiuno. And then the hunger had more power than even sorrow had over me. What does it mean? Did he or did he not? And in my opinion, really, Dante's elegant way to put it is um, a very ambiguous um, sentence. It's very ambiguous. And he chose to leave it ambiguous. Uh, did he commit this cannibalism or did, uh, did he die by normal starvation? The strength of Ugolino's teeth, strong as a dog's against the bone he tore, tells a lot about Dante's love for corporality, for uh, physicality and sensuality, and how you know, the, this man is biting as strong as a dog's bite. Incredible. At this point, uh, Ugolino uh, starts with this invective against Pisa. It's a brief invective, and of course it's Dante having this invective and letting his emotions go. Uh, she, ah, Pisa, you shame of the peoples. There is a, a little bit for everybody in, in the Inferno, in the Divine Comedy, for every town, uh, Florence, Luca, Pisa, um, to punish you, may Gorgona shift its ground and Capraia till those islands make a bar to damn the Arno and drown everybody in Pisa. These are two islands that, began, that belong to Pisa. So Dante is uh, imagining this uh, catastrophe where everybody drowns in Pisa because they deserve to. Um, but why? Because of the helpless children who have been uh, um, you know, starved in this tower. All of Dante's pity, all of Dante's attention is on the children. After verse 87, um, Dante and Virgil enter the Ptolemea, which is the third circle of Cosito, and uh, that's where the uh, traitors to host are, uh, are placed. Uh, there is no clear demarcation between Antenora and Ptolemea, but they enter. Uh, one note in particular, uh, he mentions Uguccione and Brigata in the previous Tercina. This is important because Dante wants to make sure that all four names of the four children were actually mentioned in the, in the canto. Entering Ptolemea, they are faced with uh, the sinners here who, uh, as a difference with the previous sinners, instead of having their head in fixed and turned down, it's turned up so that uh, uh, they're crying. It's almost as if Dante was looking for a punishment that's uh, worse than constantly crying because of desperation in eyes. And the only thing worse is crying and uh, having your tears freeze in your eyes so that you cannot even cry. It's brought to the extreme, in a sense. And this is a, a consequence of the fact that there is a wind. Dante can sense a wind around and he asked Virgil, what is this wind? There is no vapors, there's no climate in Inferno, so I don't understand it. And Virgil tells him, uh, no worries, you have a little patience, you're gonna see very soon what this wind is about. We know that this wind is produced by the enormous wings of Lucifer that are beating constantly, they produce this uh, um, icy wind and it ices the tears in the condemned soul's eyes. It's a very, very poetic image. And here is where Dante meets the famous Fra Alberigo. Fra Alberigo was actually part of a, of a common saying in Dante's times and even later in Florence, in Tuscany, uh, if they said, uh, uh, I've got the fruit of Fra Alberigo in Italian, that meant I've been betrayed. That's how famous his betrayal was in, uh, in Dante's world. So there is this uh, uh, head uh, crying out to Dante, asking for him to um, 
help him with his uh, eyes so that at least he can re find some relief and, and cry a little bit because he can't at this moment. Um, Dante has a peculiar behavior here. He is uh, not only not sympathetic, but uh, he um, is almost as if uh, to the treacherous, he gives treachery himself because uh, he tells him, uh, if I don't help you then, I promise I'm going to help you, if I don't help you then, may I be sent to the bottom of the ice? It's so interesting here because uh, he's playing a game, he's being clever, he's saying, may I be sent to the bottom of the ice, knowing full well that he, that's where he's going, he's going to the bottom of this uh, lake of ice. Um, let's be careful with the translation here because I've seen that, because the Italian is saying, al fondo della ghiaccia irmi convegna, which clearly means uh, uh, to go to the bottom of this lake of ice, where Lucifer is, that's where Dante is going. But uh, in some translations, I've noticed that uh, this is not properly conveyed. Uh, just to make an example, I think Frank Musa, sorry, Mark Musa, in his translation says, uh, at least until the new tears freeze again, and uh, may I be forced to drop beneath these eyes. To drop beneath these eyes has this image of Dante going below, under water almost, under the ice. But that is not what Dante is conveying. Dante is actually playing with the concept of going to where he's actually going. And therefore he doesn't have to help this condemned soul. Uh, I noticed that Mandelbaum translated well using uh, bottom of ice. And I believe Kirkpatrick as well says, uh, then I'll free your gaze or travel, promise to the deepest ice. In the Italian, Dante doesn't really promise, but the deepest eyes conveys well the little word game that he's doing here with Fra Alberigo. Um, Fra Alberigo, in history, uh, was a traitor. The, what he did was to kill his uh, father-in-law and uh, his sons um, by inviting them to a, a dinner in his house and uh, uh, at a particular sign that he made at the time of for, to eat fruit, uh, some assassins came out and paid by Fra Alberigo and killed his guests. That's why he's here in, in Ptolemy. Uh, Ptolemaeus is a classical figure that we find in, um, in the Bible, in the Maccabees, and he's another uh, man who, in the Maccabees narration, killed his father-in-law. So there is a very close uh, resemblance. And I find it uh, almost hilarious how Dante creates all this imaginary world, creates all this situation, and then he puts himself in the scene, um, and, and the character Dante, looking at this poor soul, goes, oh, you are already dead, with a huge surprise. <laughs> he, um, I, in this particular case, Dante knows that uh, Fra Alberico was not dead, and uh, he comes up with this explanation of uh, that is not completely made up by Dante because there was a teaching or a conviction that uh, in some cases when the sin was so incredibly serious and uh, terrible, uh, in some cases the soul of the person would be grabbed by Lucifer and brought down to hell even before the moment of their actual, de their actual death. So there is a, almost like a zombie theory here of these people going around Florence or Pisa as zombies, people with no soul who are already dead and they're just waiting for their physical death but their, their soul is underground. This really is a, a way, an escamotage for Dante to uh, put people uh, who he knows are still alive, in particular the person who's going to describe later, Branca Doria, uh, is one of the very few people who actually read about himself because he was still alive uh, in the Divine Comedy, when the Divine Comedy was published in Dante's times. Because the majority of, uh, of the people mentioned by Dante uh, had already died, but Branca was alive and well, and uh, as a traitor he, he knew what Dante was uh, referring to. So here we have this other soul, Ser Branca Doria, who was uh, another Ghibelline. He was actually from Genoa and he murdered, uh, he also murdered his father-in-law. His father-in-law was uh, Michele Zanke, whom we have already heard 
in Inferno 22nd among the Baratieri, where all the devils were um, creating mayhem. So again, almost like a zombie, he is uh, eating, drinking, sleeping, putting on clothes, but he doesn't have a soul. He is he's dead inside. Um, his body, uh, a devil has encroached his body and uh, he did his kinsman and take his place in it. Uh, and now, as I crave, reach out your hand and open my eyes for me. That was the agreement, but Dante doesn't do it. Uh, in fact, uh, he said to the reader, I did not open them, for to be rude to such a one as him was courtesy. This is the righteous indignation that Dante uh, has been going back to, I think, since uh, Canto 8 or 9, probably earlier than that. A Genoese, to every accustomed good, strangers. Uh, one of the few towns that Dante hadn't insulted yet was Genoa. It's not a matter of insulting the towns, obviously. It's a matter of, for Dante to express uh, all this indignation towards uh, the worst parts of humanity in these places. So here we are. This is... Uh, we are at the Ptolemia. We are very close to, to Lucifer. We're very close to the last canto, which is Canto 34 of Inferno. And uh, I thank you for uh, following so far. It's, uh, it's been a really exciting trip so far, exciting journey and very dramatic. And uh, um, let me know what you think about uh, Canto 33. Uh, I'm curious to see if uh, you, find it, you found it as intense as, uh, as I did. Um, and if you think that it deserves a place in uh, maybe the top three or top five cantos uh, of the entire Inferno, if not the Divine Comedy. Thank you very much again. Have a great weekend.